Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. This is J.R. Moore coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks on Thursday, the second day of August, year of our Lord, 2012. Welcome to the John Moore Show. Well, we have uh, 73 degrees here uh, uh, deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks on the way to a high of, uh, they tell us, 99 degrees. Uh, chance of thunder showers in the afternoon. Uh, it's been real spotty, uh, the little bit of rain we've had. Uh, I barely get in the ground watch is what I've seen. Uh, the drought continues, and we got a bunch of earth change headlines here at standao.com. We have my friend Tim Spencer patiently waiting in the green room, and we'll just jump right in here with a whole list of earth change headlines at standao.com, beginning with historic drought and giant dust storms and massive power grid failures, a glimpse into our future. Then we've got going out to North Carolina. At least four water spouts strike North Carolina's Outer Banks. Beautiful part of the country. I really like the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Next headline, study. The west, western part of the United States forest could see 100-year drought. Then we've got drought hit cattlemen. Ethanol hurting us. Give us a break. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about using corn to make alcohol. Uh, I just learned this out, learned this in the past six or eight months myself. What's left over from making the corn is the mash. That mash is more nutritious and better for the cattle than the corn was before it was made into mash. And the cattle, man, cattle ranchers competitively bid on that mash to get their hands on it. It's very good feed for the cattle. Uh, then we have uh, extreme weather up 30% across the United States. And Stan Dale notes these are the events that he's warned about for 15 years, especially on Coast to Coast and other radio stations. Um, next headline, group warns about more extreme weather in Colorado. Then we have severe storm risk for Atlanta, Tallahassee, and Jacksonville. Going out to Colorado, extremely rare Colorado tornado, the second highest altitude tornado in U.S. history. Here's our break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Our guest is Mr. Tim Spencer. Tim is a rancher, a father, grandfather, the proprietor of the excellent website, RuralSurvival.info. Good morning, Tim. Morning, John. How are you doing this morning? Real good, real good. Um, good morning, do you think we'll get any rain today? I hope so. I got lucky last <laughs> night. We got almost a quarter of an inch. <laughs> almost First a quarter. First time we had puddles in the yard since last March. Well, we didn't get the ground wet, no quarter inch here. Uh, a few scattered drops, and, and it was gone. Didn't even get the car wet or, the, or, or anything. Um, uh, too bad. Tim, you and I were talking privately last night about something I found out, and then you, you confirmed independently. I first told you about a retired full bird colonel who's being uh, called back from retirement uh, as of August 15th is his report date for a 90-day deployment. And then what right. did you tell me about your son? Well, what I what I had told you was that he also had to go in on the 15th, but I was wrong on the dates. It's the 11th. And he said report of this of month of August. And in fact, they've already put him on, you know, the what they call federal orders, full-time work. And uh, he's shipping out, I think, tomorrow. And I thought it was Pennsylvania, but I was wrong on that too. It's Minnesota. So Minnesota. anyway, I thought, okay. yeah, Minnesota. But they've already put him on the uh, on the orders where he, you know, basically has a full time job and gets getting paid like active duty. And this, this was a, something to just an overnight type thing. You know, they gave him basically four or five days notice, and um, you know, they sent him. So you say that he's leaving tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, and it's supposed to be a 90-day deployment? Right. And they haven't told him why. They just tell no. him where he's going, but not why. Correct. Okay. Well, this colonel, um, whose name I have, but I'm not going to talk about it publicly, uh, he wouldn't. He could not even tell his own brother. He, apparently he knows where he's going and why he's going there, but uh, he could not or would not tell his own brother uh, right. where he's headed. But his job, I, I thought it was graves registration. It's actually what his job is, is to lead a unit uh, whose job is to recover bodies. That's what okay. they do, is recover bodies. And uh, I, 
I was, my pre, my presumption is that could be either from a uh, battle situation or a natural disaster. Either one, uh, it mm-hmm. could be that, that body recovery type of. Uh, uh, right. Well, they use um, the same people for both. I would think so, and basically the same <laughs> skills. Except right. if it's in a if it's in a war, you, you always have the chance of hostile activity, of course. Um, right. So I, I think that's very significant that we have these, these independent confirmations. Uh, from personal, private, trusted sources about these deployments coming up, um, which fits hand in glove with um, a lot of a lot of things you and I have been talking about, both publicly and privately, about the prognosis for the next 90 days, August, September, October, um, into November. Um, a lot of speculation out there, isn't there, Tim? Yeah, there is, <laughs> and. Uh... Let's just say I think things are going to get very interesting in the next, from basically from now to eight weeks out in the Middle East. Uh, I don't see how things can maintain a status quo for another eight weeks, really. Something's going to give. We've got all those forces in the area from all over the world. There's going to be a miscalculation on somebody's part, or, you know, the money's going to start running out for keeping people deployed, and they're going to decide right. to do something, one or the other. Right. Well, this whole Arab Spring thing, uh, it, it reminds me of what happened in 1989, 1990. We were supposed to believe in that period of time, 1989, 1990, that all the captive communist peoples of East Europe, spontaneously young people, rose up basically demanding blue jeans and rock and roll and saying we don't want communism anymore, and all these communist dictatorships with standing armies and secret police uh, just collapse without a shot being fired. Um, well, that's not exactly well, the truth of the matter. You know, we're supposed to believe that. Now we're supposed to believe that um, these Islamic people, Muslims, who, by the way, uh, the word Islam means submission. and mm-hmm. uh, These are people who really don't want our demand. Uh, what we would call democracy or a representative form of government, any way, shape, no. or form. They don't. They're quite happy with what they got. And we're supposed to believe that these people who are happy with what they have are spontaneously rising up against uh, these countries and overthrowing them. Um, when, in fact, my belief, and I'm, I'm sure you, you probably share my belief, Tim, is that uh, there is heavy foreign influence, uh, foreign money, foreign intelligence help, uh, help with communications, equipment, uh, weapons, and, and, and training and all these things. Uh, and these are anything but uh, grassroots, spontaneous events. What do, you th- what do you say? Well, I agree fully. It's all about imperial control. You know, and basically it's about money. Right. You know, it, it, yes, you've got governments, you've got major companies, uh, mineral and oil companies pumping money in there like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, it, it's all about... Uh, Basically, the empire of the United States taking over, you know, for its own benefit. You know, well, that, that's in, the bottom line. In addition, many of these Muslim countries, you know, I don't have any use for Islam. It's as far as no, my, 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 it's a it's a bizarre, strange, barbaric, and dangerous religion and way of life. On one hand, on the other, uh, they do. When it comes to banking, they understand banking and usury. And uh, I know Libya, for a fact, uh, uh, was not part of the international banking system. And I found it kind of ironic, and I didn't, it didn't surprise me, that uh, the uh, spontaneous grassroots uprising in Libya uh, got connected to the international banking community real quick, didn't I? Oh, yeah, I did. Absolutely. It was, in a way, it was almost comical. You know, not, not that death and dying and warfare is comical, but the basis of it, uh, and the excuses and the ideas put forward by the main street media, that was a comical part It of. was. Now, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, he always reminded me of this kind of a wannabe uh, rock and roll star, the way he had that, uh, that poofed up hair that he wore. But, right. uh, but he didn't, he didn't, he was not part of the international banking community. He didn't participate in uh, that whole international banking scam. As people were free of international banking intrigue, and the country was free of international banking intrigue, and and, uh, and he actually and took care of his people too. And he did. That, that's what people forget. You know, they had free medical care, free education. In some ways, the people in that country 
had it better than we have it here. Well, he he uh, certainly you know, he when took, he was in charge. That's right, and he used oil revenues to pay for all those things, and yeah. and uh, and uh, there was no uh, dissatisfaction or disharmony in Libya. People liked that country, and, and they liked the benefits of being a a citizen of of Libya. Um, so. Anyway, Tim, I agree with you. The Middle East is a powder keg uh, with the fuse is lit, and how, we just simply don't know how long the fuse is, do we? No, but if you have any idea, or to give you an idea, <clears throat> uh, Khomeini, if that, I know that's not the proper pronunciation, called the, all the top military leaders together about 36 hours ago for what he called the final war council and declared that uh, war within weeks would occur. Who made that and, declaration? Uh, the uh, Ayatollah took a name in Iran. In Iran, yes, in Iran. Yeah. Uh, well, they had their own intelligence. This they have their own intelligence service, and of course, uh, they they have their own agenda. They believe that the Mahdi, uh, which is um, their uh, savior, is uh, going to reveal himself soon. Um, mm hmm. And climb out of the well. <laughs> they they also believe that uh, uh, it's it's their um, mission to establish these Islamic republics uh, all over the world, literally, uh, and and that their and that their goal is to have Islam be the one and the only religion worldwide, uh, yeah. with everybody else, uh, uh, you know. It doesn't comply with it being dead, basically. Uh, right. Very bizarre, strange, barbaric, and dangerous uh, mindset and thought and religion, uh, Islam. Um, it was kind of ironic, Tim. We have a, one, a Muslim member of Congress. I, I think you're probably aware of that, aren't you? Yes, I don't remember his name, but yes, I am aware that we do and have was, one. He was so delighted to... Uh, find out there was a copy of the Quran in, in uh, Thomas Jefferson's private library and, and he made arrangements with the National Archives to be sworn in using the Quran instead of the Bible for a swearing in ceremony. Uh, what's not known publicly is the reason why Thomas Jefferson has had a copy of the Quran in his, in his private library. That's because he was doing opposition research. He was studying his enemy. Right. Uh, if you recall the uh, uh, the Marine Corps hymn, um, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Well, right. The shores of Tripoli uh, is Libya, Tripoli, Libya. And uh, we were you know, having uh, ongoing wars and battles with Islam and, and, uh, in that part of the world when Thomas Jefferson was president. That's why he had a copy of the Quran in his private mm -hmm. library, not because he liked Islam or he thought anything about Islam was worthwhile, but because he was studying his enemy and wanted to have knowledge of his enemy. That's why he had a copy of the Quran. Yes, very true. We're coming up on a break here pretty soon. Tim, we're, uh, of course, you are the proprietor of RuralSurvival.info. When we get back from the break, uh, we'll talk about what's going on with it. Okay, sounds great, John. Okay. Stay tuned. The break should be here momentarily. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. Tim and I have our 50 pound backpacks off, and we're ready to sit down and do some more radio here. RuralSurvival.info. Uh, I've got this up on the screen here in front of me. Very well done, professional looking website. If you haven't checked it out, ladies and gentlemen, you need to do that. And, um,. Of course, you have a number of authors here, and, and I know we talk about this frequently, Tim. You you always are have the door open looking for new authors, don't you? Oh, sure do. In fact, we just got a, a new gentleman. I believe his last name is Montgomery on uh, Alternative Energy. Uh, actually, he wrote in a week or so ago, and I've just now gotten to him, and he's going to be providing some uh, very interesting information on solar energy. And, Good uh, there's, oh. Yeah, and... I, we've also, of course, got Diane Zerker and Vicky, uh, Victoria Columbus and several others that have been contributing uh, copious amounts of information, a lot of which I was able to get up yesterday afternoon on the site. Outstanding. Well, really happy to hear that, Tim. 
uh, a growing website. This is, uh, what, the third year for the website, I believe? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Third year. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, for those, we have a lot of new listeners these past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, what, what was the underlying premise for starting this? Promoting self-sufficiency uh, for people that live in a rural environment like you and I do, John. Originally, when I first started uh, the website, it was, it would, I guess you'd call it a niche. There wasn't anything else out there about, you know, made for farmers and ranchers. Now, there are other sites now, which is a good thing. I'm not competing with anyone. But uh, at the time, there wasn't anything, and we decided to put that together, and you were my first contributor to the site, and uh, we went from there. And now I think we've got a total of, well, it's over a dozen authors, I know. And uh, okay. with about four of them contributing routinely. Well, that's good because so. it's a win-win situation for everybody. Uh, uh, the author gets to be a published author. The readers get their information, um, and of course, the website gets uh, gets uh, more uh, content for people to be reading. So it's really a win-win situation for everybody, isn't it? Yes, it is. It certainly is. Okay. And if a person wanted to become an author, uh, writing about something that they have knowledge of, and it could be more than one thing, how would they contact you, Tim? Well, the best way is by email, office at ruralsurvival.info. And I do check my email daily. Uh, since we are rural, we do occasionally lose Internet service. So, uh, But I do check it daily, and I try to reply as quickly as I can. Once in a while, I'll forget to reply to an email. I'm human. But, uh, you know, just keep pinging on me. If you don't hear from me within a day or two, write me again. Okay, well, that's fair enough. RuralSurvival.info. And the way to contact you is office at RuralSurvival.info. Correct. All right, way to go. Uh, the uh, website has uh, some interesting automated systems here. Uh, we have uh, all the... Uh, the commodities at the top there, oil and uh, and uh, soybeans and wheat and hogs and all that stuff scrolling across there. And that's real time, isn't it? Uh, I think the, yes, all that is real time. Yes, it is. I thought about putting a stock ticker on there. That would have been delayed 15 minutes, and I really just didn't have the room for it. But, yeah, I believe all those prices are real time. Well, that's good to know. And then... Uh, on the right side here, we have a list of the uh, emergency and disaster information from all over the planet, North America, Australia, um, China, Asia, um, and those are posted in real time also, aren't they? Yes, yes. As uh, RSOE receives and publishes the reports, they go straight on the site. Outstanding. Well, that's good to know, Tim, and um, I know you, you continue to tweak this, and I think you're... Um, I think you're pondering a, a major overhaul of the website, aren't you? Well, actually, I started it, and I'm one of these people that likes to finish a project once they start it. And I saw that I just was not going to have time to complete it this summer. I've still got what I have done uh, saved, so possibly when things slow down for me in September, I'll be able to start on the update or the overhaul again. Well, good. Good. Uh, and of course, it's going to take me about four days of solid work to get it done. Well, we're only four weeks away from September, so um, right. uh, that that will be here fairly soon. Uh, the year is kind of slipping away from us here, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <clears throat> it's going very, very quickly. Of course, yeah. I think you'll agree with me. The older you get, the faster it goes, John. That seems to be that way. We have a caller here, Douglas in New Jersey. Good morning, Douglas. Hey, John. How's it going? Real good. Nice. Yes, I Go wanted ahead, to talk to you about uh, yesterday. I'm a... Uh, Current employee at the New York Stock Exchange. Oh yes, we talked yesterday briefly. Uh, give us an update. Now you you were at the you work at the New York Stock Exchange, and something happened yesterday morning. And uh, tell us about what happened and how unusual it is. Uh, it's very unusual. It's, it's pretty confusing. Even after I looked into it all day yesterday, I still have a pretty vague understanding of the whole situation. Doug, we're going to have to hold you over through the break. We're going to have to hold you over through the break because we got about 20 seconds. Um, did any old timers that can make any comments on the last time they saw something similar like this happen? Whew. 
Um, 2010. Okay. The last crash. It's the only real reference to the last time anything like this has happened. But it's okay, a little bit different. Okay, Doug, let's hold on to the break here. Uh, we'll be back after the break. Stay tuned, everybody. Um, okay, Tim, we've got Douglas telling us here about something that's, that's pretty unusual and unique. Uh, Douglas, you were at the uh, stock exchange yesterday morning. What, what, what started? What, what time did things start going bonkers, and, and for what reason? Douglas? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I had it on mute. <laughs> uh, well, it, okay. started, it started before the bell rings. See, we get certain looks from our customers looking into certain stocks, and when we looked into those stocks, it, it was incredibly strange because certain ones had a $2 range between the bid and the offer, whereas currently being bought and sold. And uh, that was kind of made us real confused. We didn't really understand, but we did our best to give our customers the right information, but right after the bell ring, everyone started looking around. There was a murmur on the floor. People were starting to move, and uh, you can just see the general confusion on people's faces. And normally, when you say people ring, started to move, you mean physically move? Physically move, yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of people don't understand that nowadays with the technology, most brokers just sit in their booth and do get the business that they need to get done. Right, it's, right. The old system is completely, it's, it's, it's a joke compared to the old system. Okay. But, um, yeah, it pretty much was, I wouldn't say mayhem, but everyone, normally the bell rings, you know, everyone, you know, gets their stuff traded for the busy opening and then it dies down within five minutes. But right, I know this right. yesterday, it lasted about 15, 20 minutes while we right. were all talking to each other. <clears throat> And this is on the floor. And uh, after about 20 minutes, everyone had kind of settled down. Whatever had happened had, had just happened, and it was over. This, this thing was, seemed to stable out. And the weirdest thing was the amount of trading that went done. Normally, you get the opening gets like 100 million shares traded. But after right. that 20 minutes, we looked up and we saw 300 and something million shares traded. And that's really? when the guy... That's when the guy I work with woke up and said, well, something definitely happened. You know, a lot <laughs> of money was moved. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. That, that's, and uh, how would any rough idea estimate of how many dollars that $300 million, uh, uh, stock trades translated into? Uh, the that, rough is, it's pretty difficult considering that each of the stocks are all different priced and uh, uh, it's, that's uh, the logistics or something. I've I've only been working there for about eight months, and it's okay. gotten to the point where the logistics are just so ludicrous that to even try to comprehend them is what I consider a waste of time. Uh, uh -huh. It's um, fortunately I was able to get hired up there recently through to a family member and conversing well, with good. them. Oh yeah, conversing with them though he he's been up there about forty years. And uh, sometimes there's some days where he'll just be like, this is, I've never seen anything like this before. This is just weird. <laughs> a guy and with four what... decades of experience saying that, I think I'd pay attention to it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. He's the term <laughs> smoke and mirrors is the one I kept hearing within the first couple of weeks when I was asking questions. You know, and then it just gets to a point where you just don't even want to know because well, the more you know... You know a guy that was there, and he'd be about my age uh, if he's been there 40 years, he shook hands with men who were World War I veterans and worked at the stock exchange. I mean, that, so there was a lot of history there and a lot of knowledge. Oh, yeah. You know, um, when, when, he st when he started on the stock exchange, there were still World War I veterans working at the New York Stock Exchange. So just to give you a little bit of oversight into the, the depth of knowledge this man has that he, that he deals with. Uh, well, um, Douglas, we do appreciate the, the, your call, and um, uh, you, I'm sure today you're going to be watching it very carefully, aren't you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, fortunately, John, I, I, I'm blessed. I only work there part-time. I will not be okay. there today, but I do plan on calling in right after the opening and see if it's still fishy. Okay. 
Well, we, we'd like you to uh, evaluate what's going on. If you if you feel a need to give us an update, you're welcome to call any time, Douglas. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, we got another caller here, a regular caller, Charlene in North Carolina. Good morning, Charlene. John, how are you and Tim this morning? Good morning. Um, busy, busy. Okay, I <laughs> want to tell you about that. this wonderful find. I went into the U.S. Forestry Office here in town, and I was so fortunate I found a detailed topographical map of North Carolina with back roads, recreational sites, elevations are given, and it's just fantastic because it has so much information. Not the caves. Uh, I'm going to have to go to Cherokee and try to find an elder maybe to find out about that. Also, right. they have these little tiny laminated what they call the pocket naturalist guides, uh, where you can find about uh, edible trees, uh, tracking animals, uh, various things that fold up very neatly that would be very good and compact to put in your bug out bags. And um, I also want to say that when you mentioned that about recovering bodies earlier, about that, um, what do you call that? It's... Um, is there an ROI uh, about 18 months ago where the government was uh, soliciting to buy underwater body bags when yeah, they were was, buying uh, all that food? That's been, uh, you know, that's been a while ago. That was, uh, uh, yes, quite a while ago. Okay. So <clears throat> this question is directed at both of you. Uh, what is your best educated guess? that um, if, you know, there's going to be a celestial object uh, smacking into Earth or whatever, do you think the government will give the citizens any warning? Well, first of all, no scientist I work with uh, believes anything other than a, a rock the size of, uh, you know, it could be a good size rocks hit Earth, not, nothing, no planetary size object. But... Um, I don't believe there's going to be any warning of any consequence myself. Tim, what do you think? I agree. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is, uh, one, if it's a small object, something they actually could evacuate for, the odds are there's going to be little or no warning and it's going to come. Secondly, if they did have warning, it's probably going to be very short, you know, maybe hours or a couple of days, and I don't believe that they would have time to effectively evacuate any particular region of the country. Uh, that the evacuation may kill as many or more people than, you know, the rock hit. Right. That's just my personal right. opinion. I agree. Okay, well, we're now in a period of meteor showers, you know, too. Yes, ma'am. So um, I just wanted to get your opinions on that. Okay, thank you so much, and thank have a great call, day. Darling. We appreciate it. Um, well, uh it's been an interesting show so far, and um, this is a time we've got about uh, 17, 18 minutes to talk about a wonderful little device called the Energy Cleaner. And we typically start with my friend Tom Berryhill, who manufactures the Energy Cleaner, uh, giving out our disclaimer. Tom, if you would, please, sir. Good morning. Morning, John. How are you guys today? Real good. Doing good, John. Great. Tom, you want to give us your disclaimer, please? Okay. Yes, I didn't know we were ready for that. Okay, John. <laughs> it's it's been hot out here on the federal plantation. It, it, you know, know. We're, we're moving slow. I know. <laughs> okay, we are, we are not doctors or medical professionals. We don't diagnose or cure any illness or disease. The information discussed today is for your education and entertainment only. If you have a medical condition needing treatment, you should utilize the services of a medical doctor, chiropractor, or other competent practitioner. Outstanding. With that said, uh, the energy cleaner is listed on my website. There's a photograph of it and testimonials. Uh, this past January, I was uh, doing a presentation at one of the meetups in uh, Springfield, Missouri, that Vince Finelli sponsors. And uh, I made an announcement during the meetup that I'd, I'd like to speak to anybody afterwards who has issues with pain, or chronic pain especially, that uh, would like to talk to me about possibly getting an energy cleaner. Well, I, at the end of the, my presentation, I did speak to several people, and one of them was John Reagan. And uh, John impressed me, uh, uh, along with his wife, as being two people who could, 
could gain some benefit from using the energy cleaner. And uh, John is on hold here. In fact, he's on Skype, and he sounds like he's right in the studio in Austin, Texas. Good morning, John. Good morning, John. Outstanding audio. Um, well, you've been using Energy Clear now. This is month number eight, and uh, you, like most intelligent thinking uh, people, looked at this little plastic box and thought, okay, this little thing's going to help me. <laughs> and it doesn't even have an on switch. It doesn't even have an off on switch. There are no dials, no gauges. It has a little LED light that lights up green for a couple of minutes and red for a couple of minutes. So, uh, despite your. Uh, uh, not being uh, anything other than uh, very uh, pessimistic, you went ahead and started using it anyway. And, and what happened when you started using it, John? Well, uh, even after the first night, the uh, big thing I noticed the next morning is I got up and stood up and my muscles weren't uh, sore like they normally are. Well, it's off to a good start. And you, you've been using, you have not used the bathtub method at all. I believe you're only using the aluminum screen wire method where you have an aluminum screen wire uh, on, or actually you've been using CAD5 computer cable um, uh, as a pad to generate the uh, electrostatic signal uh, these past eight months. Well, we've, we've tried both, and uh, we're, we're actually getting some better results with the screen wire. Okay, so that, that's good to know. And uh, a lot of people, they, they do experiment with different methods. Um, your current home doesn't have a bathtub, so you haven't been able to make use of the bathtub method. But um, your wife has some issues with some joint pain as well, I believe, doesn't she? Yes, she does, um, uh, both knees and back. And, and, uh, she, and what, what's been uh, the uh, consequences of using the energy cleaner for your wife? It's definitely helped. Okay. And uh, your wife was also uh, reaching that point in her life, as all women do, where she was starting to commence the, as what's called the change of life. And uh, she had an, an unexpected uh, uh, thing happen. Tell us about that. Well, uh, when you get to that point, it's a 12-month period to decide whether or not you, you've actually hit that point. And she was right at that 12-month point and has to restart the clock. And... Uh, you know, she hasn't uh, had another cycle since, but she's had some indications that maybe she's going to, so um, we're still waiting to see more on that front. Right, right. And uh, I don't know, if, if Tom, if you've heard about such a thing happening in the past, you've had more experience with this than I have, but it sounds like the energy cleaner is somewhat uh, rejuvenating, it, doesn't it, John? Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Tom Berryhill, have you heard of such a thing happening with women in the past? Oh Yeah, what I've heard more, though, uh, is that their uh, menstrual cycle will be shortened in, uh, in duration. It, it just happens a lot quicker, so they're not, uh, if there's any inconvenience, it's, it's uh, not quite as bad. Well, that's a good thing to know also. Outstanding. Um, well, uh, I'll be down in Springfield one one day soon here. I, I can't say when, John, but I look forward to seeing you and your wife at a, at a meetup in the next month or two, and uh, we can we can get reacquainted, and you can give me some personal updates on how that's working out for you. Um, anything else to add this morning, John? Before we move on? Uh, no, we'll talk to you later. Okay, thanks for the call, John. Um, now, Tim Spencer, uh, you've been using the Energy Cleaner now since. Uh, I believe around the first of October or so. Right. Would that be somewhat okay. Yeah, and, that's, that's uh, right. End of September, first of October of last year. And you also, like most thinking uh, intelligent adults, uh, was not terribly optimistic about this rather innocent-looking, simplistic-looking um, cream-colored plastic box, uh, the size of a cigar box. Were you? No, I, I wasn't, John, but since it was you recommending it, you know, and I trust you implicitly, I, you know, decided to try it. And, and the uh, results have been nothing short of amazing. Now, 1984, which would be 28 years ago, you uh, suffered an injury on an active duty on a U.S. Navy, US Navy nuclear submarine. And right. um, you broke your back. Uh, and uh, that yeah, began... No, uh, it was broke, it's broken for about three months after I did it. That well, that's not problem. unusual for for a healthy young man to just tough out the pain and go on. That's not un, all that unusual, is it? I don't think so. No, it's about you know. There's a whole in your in your military. There's a whole macho thing too about uh, 
pain and suffering and injuries, uh, where you basically deny you're injured. Uh, but at some point, you had to uh, step up to the plate and get some uh, professional diagnosis, and that's when you found out that your back, in fact, was broken, didn't you? Yes, I did. Originally, they thought I had a kidney infection. I was in the hospital the same time my daughter was born. And after, uh, you see, I think it was either a CAT scan or MRI, they told me what the results were, and that began six and a half years of therapy, surgery, and you name it, and finally resulted and, in me getting a medical discharge. And the uh, the pain medications began when? And 84. 84. So 28 years ago, you started you started taking prescription pain medications, and as as far as you know, you've probably taken every prescription ma uh, painkiller known to Western civilization. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I I'm still on two, but uh, not near the dosage I used to be on. I'm down uh, to somewhere between one quarter and one third of what I used to take. Well. Uh, that's had some. Tell us about the changes to your life since well, you've had the, this dramatic the, reduction. Well, the greatest, the greatest benefit that I can see, other than lack of pain, is the fact that without all these medications, my mental clarity is way up on the scale compared to what it used to be. Outstanding. So, oh, sounds like we got a break, we got everybody. A, we got a break. We'll come back in a moment. Everybody, stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. This is J.R. Moore. It is Thursday, the 2nd of August. We've got Mr. Tim Spencer on hold here. We have Mr. Tom Berry. Um, well, Tim, this small device puts out an electrostatic signal that acts as a pumping mechanism to pump out the uh, toxic stuff and waste products and pump in uh, nice, fresh, clean nutrition into every cell in your body. Um, it doesn't act as a blocking mechanism like pain medication to stop the pain. It acts to heal, and, and the healing is why you're feeling less pain and needing less pain medication, Tim. Yes, sir. I would say that is absolutely the case. Now, I don't, you know, even though it's been explained to me multiple times, I don't understand all the intricacies of how it works. All I know is it does work for me. Well, and and I certainly am pretty much the same boat you are. I'm no, uh, radio, you know, electrical engineer by any means, or or doctor either one. So, um, Tim, uh, if you, if you could summarize in 60 seconds your your thoughts, we need to move on, please. Okay. Well, folks, the, the really the only thing I can say about the energy cleaner is it's made a tremendous change in my life and improve and improve my uh, quality of life. You know, I'm not saying it's going to work for each individual person. I don't know that, but I do know it works for me. Uh, you know, less pain medication. I don't have to have help getting out of bed every morning like I used to, and that was probably four or five days out of every week I used to. Now uh, I don't think that I've had, well, maybe one time in January this year I had to have help getting out of bed, but uh, I overdid it the day before. Right, I know you were on a cold concrete floor working on a tractor. Tom, thank you. Yeah. I'll be in touch privately. All right, you have a good one, John. Okay. Well, Tom, uh, you're the manufacturer of the energy cleaner, and uh, uh, you, you've uh, made uh, your your life's work it's for a number of years now, uh, manufacturing and selling energy cleaners, doing a, uh, presentations for uh, medical doctors and chiropractors and just everyday people. It's very satisfying work, isn't it? It sure is. And, you know, earlier uh, Tim mentioned his uh, mental clarity is better. He can think uh, more clearly. And and uh, just recently a, a elderly lady contacted me. She said her friend wants an energy cleaner. And it's along those same lines, John. Uh, this woman uses it to uh, increase her uh, mental capabilities. She's in her late 80s. And she told me this is one time a tinfoil hat is good. She actually lines her, makes like a, a cap, like a, a, a scarf out of aluminum foil and clips the output cable from the energy cleaner under that foil. And she said it's helped her quite a bit. And what happened is tomorrow, and I thought it was Pennsylvania, but I was wrong on that too. It's Minnesota. So Minnesota. But anyway, I thought, okay. yeah, Minnesota. But they've already put him on the, uh, on the orders where he, you know, basically has a full-time job and gets, getting paid like active duty. And this, this was a, something to just, an overnight type thing. You know, they gave him basically four or five days notice and, um, you know, they sent him, so. You said he's leaving tomorrow? Yeah. 
Okay. And it's supposed to be a 90-day 90, 90, 90 deployment? Right. And they haven't told them why. But they just tell no. them where he's going, but not why. Correct. Okay. Well, this colonel, um, whose name I have, but I'm not going to talk about it publicly, uh, he wouldn't. He could not even tell his own brother. He, apparently, he knows where he's going and why he's going there, but uh, he could not or would not tell his own brother uh, right. where he's headed. But his job, I, I thought it was graves registration. It's actually what his job is is to lead a unit uh, whose job is to recover bodies. That's what okay. they do: is recover bodies. And uh, I have all dot info. Good morning, Tim. Morning, John. How are you doing this morning? Real good, real good. Um, yes, sir. Do you think we'll get any rain today? I hope so. I got lucky last <laughs> night. We got almost a quarter of an inch. <laughs> almost. First time we had puddles in the yard since last March. Well, we didn't get the ground wet. No quarter inch here. Uh, a few scattered drops, and and it was gone. Didn't even get the car wet or the, or the, or anything. Um, uh, too bad. Tim, you and I were talking privately last night about something I found out, and then you you confirmed independently. I first told you about a retired full bird colonel who's being uh, called back from retirement uh, as of August 15th as his report date for a 90-day deployment. And then what right. did you tell me about your son? Well, what I what I had told you was that he also had to go in on the 15th, but I was wrong on the dates. It's the 11th. And he's had a report of this of month of August. And in fact, they've already put him on, you know, the what they call federal orders, full-time work. And uh, he's shipping out, I think. To I, my pre, my presumption is that could be either from a uh, battle situation or a natural disaster, either one. It, it mm -hmm. could be that, that body recovery type of... Uh, uh, right. Well, they use uh, the same people for both. I would think so, and basically the same skills, except right. if, it's in a, if it's in a war, you always have the chance of hostile activity, of course. Um, right. So I think that's very significant that we have these, these independent confirmations uh, from personal, private, trusted sources about these deployments coming up, um, which fits hand in glove with um, a, lot of, a lot of things you and I have been talking about, both publicly and privately about the prognosis for the next 90 days, August, September, October, um, into November. Um, a lot of speculation out there, isn't there, Tim? Yeah, there is. <laughs> and uh, let's just say I think things are going to get very interesting in the next, from basically from now to eight weeks out in the Middle East. Uh, I don't see how things can maintain a status quo for another eight weeks, really. Something's going to give. We've got all those forces in the area from all over the world. There's going. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about using corn to make alcohol. Uh, I just learned this out, learned this in the past six or eight months myself. What's left over from making the corn is the mash. That mash is more nutritious and better for the cattle than the corn was before it was made into mash. And the cattle man, cattle ranchers competitively bid on that mash to get their hands on it. It's very good feed for the cattle. Uh, then we have uh, extreme weather up 30% across the United States. And Stan Dale notes these are the events that he's warned about for 15 years, especially on Coast to Coast and other radio stations. Um, next headline, group warns about more extreme weather in Colorado. Then we have severe storm risk for Atlanta, Tallahassee, and Jacksonville. Going out to Colorado, extremely rare Colorado tornado, the second highest altitude tornado in U.S. history. Here's our break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Our guest is Mr. Tim Spencer. Tim is a rancher, a father, grandfather, the proprietor of the excellent website Rural Survival. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. This is J.R. Moore coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks on Thursday, the second day of August year of our Lord, 2012. Welcome to the John Moore Show. Well, we have uh, 73 degrees here uh, uh, deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks on the way to a high of, uh, they tell us, 99 degrees. A uh, chance of thunder showers in the afternoon. Uh, it's been real spotty, uh, the little bit of rain we've had. Uh, I, 
barely getting the groundwork is what I've seen. Uh, the drought continues, and we got a bunch of earth change headlines here at standao.com. We have my friend Tim Spencer patiently waiting in the green room, and we'll just jump right in here with a whole list of earth change headlines at standao.com, beginning with historic drought and giant dust storms and massive power grid failures, a glimpse into our future. Then we've got going out to North Carolina. At least four water spouts strike North Carolina's Outer Banks. Beautiful part of the country. I really like the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Next headline, study. The west, western part of the United States forest could see 100-year drought. Then we've got drought hit cattlemen. Ethanol hurting us. Give us a break. 